the energy is back what's going on everybody live from everyone hates tesla we're going to be talking about energy today and what is the mega pack a lot of you guys don't know about it the power of tesla's mega pack is revolutionizing energy storage a brief introduction to tesla's mission and how they want to accelerate to sustainable energy i would say it's the most effective and efficient energy okay what is the mega pack well explanation of the mega pack is a highly powered battery system designed for utility scale energy systems and in this video we're going to go through another link shout outs to the other videos that's going to be included fair use to show you guys what that's about description of the components include battery cells intervals and thermal management systems something like the auto bidder okay how does it work well we're going to show that in this video but as you guys can see oh excuse me we got always a disruption we always got things getting in our way when we're trying to actually conduct the video we're going to get to the next video so we're going to click off of this and we're going to get right into the main video about this here we go the limiting factor fair use we did a like already and we're following them. let's go welcome back everyone i'm jordan gisagi and this is the limiting factor Tesla's Megapack business for grid-scale battery energy storage more than doubled in 2023, and much more growth is expected in the coming years thanks to expansions already underway in Lathrop, California, and Shanghai. This raises the question, how big could the Megapack business get and by when? To answer that question, today I'll walk you through my assumptions on how the adoption of battery energy storage will evolve between now and 2050, the potential market size of each phase, and how much of that storage market Tesla could ultimately take. Before we begin, so we got two factories. We got one in California and one being built out in Shanghai. Now that's going to take about possibly 16 more months. Who knows? But we build out these factories pretty quickly, but it still needs to ramp after that. So it's going to be about one to two years until we even start seeing the true return on our investment. We begin a special thanks to my Patreon supporters, YouTube members, and Twitter subscribers as well to evolve over the coming years. What I'm providing today is a rough interpretation of how I expect the grid to evolve with a focus on Tesla as of content. So this is this has been extensive content that has been written on the topic of grid storage, especially in the United States. But what he's specifically saying is that he's going to focus on Tesla and how that's going to impact us as potential Tesla investors or enthusiasts and people who just enjoy to watch the show written on the topic of grid storage and how it's expected to evolve over the coming years. What I'm providing today is a rough interpretation of how I expect the grid to evolve with a focus on Tesla. As usual, I'll include my assumptions and thought process so that you can form your own view. Let's start with Tesla's estimate for the size of the grid storage market for batteries. Last year, after Investor Day, Tesla released a white paper titled Master Plan Part 3, Sustainable Energy for All of Earth. In that paper, their estimate was that for the U.S. alone, the total amount of 8-hour lithium-ion storage required to make the transition to renewable energy was 6.5 terawatt-hours. That's helpful because it gives us a fair estimate for the maximum amount of batteries required. However, it's not a forecast, so it doesn't include information on what's likely and by when. As a side note, the paper doesn't define what's meant by 8-hour lithium-ion storage. As far as I can tell, it just seems to be using 8-hour duration as a somewhat arbitrary unit of measurement to show how much energy is stored and released. In this case, that's 8 hours of duration multiplied by 815 gigawatts of power for a total of 6.5 terawatt hours of energy. That means the 8-hour duration doesn't seem to be implying anything about the duration rating that Tesla expects that most grid storage batteries will actually have. Moving along, to add some granularity on duration and time frames, let's bring in forecasting from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. All right, so he's going to use the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to even be able to project where we're going in the future and forecast what's the stages of development for the storage that we need in the United States of America. Let's continue. Or NRO. NREL expects that, for the U.S., the deployment of grid storage to support renewable energy will progress through four phases between now and 2050. You may notice that as the four phases progress that the durations get longer. Why is that? Two reasons. First, as grids increasingly shift to intermittent energy sources like wind and solar, they'll require greater reserves of grid storage to provide power when there's demand spikes or shortages in supply. Second, it's more difficult to make long-duration energy storage cost-effective. That's for several reasons, but let's cover just two. 
First, longer duration storage has fewer revenue opportunities over the course of its life because it charges and discharges more slowly. Yes, grid storage that takes longer to discharge will typically last longer, but there's a limit to that. And in the meantime, the storage will be incurring expenses like maintenance, property taxes, and financing costs. So operating expenses will continue while we're still trying to wait for shelling out energy to actually generate revenue. Second, typically lower price volatility is seen on longer time frames, which makes the revenue lower when energy is needed at the peaks. The fact that longer duration storage has fewer revenue opportunities and earns less for them means that cost is one of the primary limiting factors for the deployment of longer duration storage. However, the cost of energy storage is continually getting cheaper thanks to economies of scale and technology improvements. So Technology improvement, economy of scales, and innovation. Innovation is definitely a big reason. I wouldn't say that it's getting cheaper just because of those two metrics, but of course, he's just provided some context, so let's continue. So we'll gradually see more and longer duration energy storage projects deployed over time. Although NREL's four phases do provide more granularity than Tesla's monolithic 6.5 terawatt hour estimate, they still don't provide specific years for when they expect the phases to occur. They don't specify the types of technologies that will be used for grid storage, and they measure the capacity in terms of gigawatts of power and don't provide a figure for gigawatt hours of energy, all of which is important if we want to combine NREL and Tesla's estimate to create a forecast. Now, guys, again, that's completely difficult. They already have done or conducted a lot of due diligence of research for, for them to actually also say what specific technology and put in a time frame. Uh, that, that would be a lot of assumptions and it still take a lot of energy, attention and time to do that. And I think the information that they provided thus far has been good enough. So let's move forward. With that in mind, let's trim the information out of the NREL table that we don't need and then fill in the blanks. The first line of the NREL table includes capacity from before 2010 from pumped hydro. I'll delete that line because it's capacity that's already installed. The last line of the NREL table focuses on multi-day to seasonal capacity. Tesla's model assumes that seasonal energy storage will be handled by hydrogen, and I agree with that assessment. ShareSite is the portfolio tracking and reporting tool that so takes the hassle out of... We're going to provide certain specific energy for a specific uh, generator, energy. right? So solar is specific to what we're going to utilize our storage units for. So let's continue. Storage by Ian Stoffel and Oliver Schmidt. They show that by 2040, grid storage durations of 16 hours or less will be dominated by lithium ion batteries and storage durations of 16 hours or more will be dominated by hydrogen. If you'd like, and you see, there it goes right there. And if you'd like to check it out, he's going to provide the information. If you'd like to read that book, it's available for free online. And all. So this is one of the things I want you guys to pay attention to. If people are, let's say, making an assumption about Tesla, or they're a stock analyst, or whatever they want to call themselves, a wealth manager, etc. Do you think that they're doing the due diligence? I've actually read it into the industry to figure out what's the potential for Tesla to be able to capitalize on this industry. Is it time and is it prime for innovation? Maybe, maybe not. So NVIDIA, for the most part, has made, let's just say, monumental changes on their chips for a long time. They have been innovating. But did the majority of Wall Street actually understand the tech behind it in the industry and the demand? Not so much. And it's no fault to them. I'm not going to blame them. They keep track of a lot of stocks, not just one, you know, hundreds. They're always doing these, you know, CNN reports and contributing and debating this stock and on a daily basis, monthly basis, who ate egg and had a scandal that will reflect the price today versus tomorrow and then the long term and the near term. So they're always grappling with short term issues and they don't really have time to go down range and go conduct investigations and read into the technology and the business and the industries that are being disrupted. They're probably going to see it back a little bit later when it actually shows up on a financial spreadsheet. Then they're like, oh my gosh, look at this. Uh, revolution is happening in the energy department. Oh my gosh, look at this. Revolution is happening in AI with ChatGPT and NVIDIA and the new Blackwell. Like They find out afterwards. But this is where, of course, we could take a role and do this due diligence to the companies, not just Tesla, but any company you guys are investing in, and then find the information, source it, and then understand what's going on with your company, how it can move from good to great. I'll link it in the description. Since today's focus is on battery energy storage rather than hydrogen storage, we can eliminate the last line. 
but I'm still going to build in four phases for today's analysis rather than three. Why? Because there's significant overlap in the duration ranges in the NREL table for phases two and three. NREL overlap them for good reason, which is that the primary grid services they list can use multiple energy storage durations. However, my goal today is to look at how much of each duration is needed and by when, which means we need clear differentiation between the phases. So I'm going to break the second and third phases into three phases, which cover durations up to four hours, eight hours, and 12 hours. And I'll leave phase one at up to one hour. As a side note, up to four hours means between one and four hours, and so on. But I'm listing specific durations, such as one, four, eight, and twelve hours, rather than duration ranges, because it makes the calculations I'll do in a moment easier. Next, let's add some. So now he's going to basically continue to walk us through his process of how he's actually going to come to the end conclusion. We're going to skip ahead, right? Because we're going to learn specifically not how he came to this conclusion, because you guys can just watch that video on your own. You can go back and check out the limiting factor that's the name of the channel but now we want to figure out okay how many mega pack factories does tesla need to fill the void now he was just walking us through how he made his calculation cast with the global forecast in place let's look at how much of the global market share for battery energy storage tesla can absorb with their mega pack products according to trendforce for 2023 the global battery energy storage market was about 117 gigawatt hours and according to tesla's q4 2023 earnings call they deployed 14.72 gigawatt hours that means tesla deployed about 12.5 percent of global battery energy storage production in 2023 in 2022 the number was 12.8 percent and in 2021 it was 6.6 percent now of course there was a little mistake on the editing he said 6.4 but it was like 16 there but it's all good three was the first year that tesla began scaling their first dedicated megapack factory which they'll duplicate and scale over the coming years, and they're already planning to quadruple production capacity by the end of the year. With that in mind, I expect Tesla to take at least 15% of the global battery energy storage market over the coming 10 to 20 years. Now, 10 to 20 years, and then he's going to have a high case. We're going to have a bear and a bull case, a low and a high. And these are assumptions, and I'm assuming from at least how he's been about going to create the equation, he's going to be very conservative in what he's going to have to say. So let's let's tune in. Let's see what he's talking about. What about a more bullish case? To work that out, it becomes more speculative. Let's walk through the methodology I used. I started by looking at current global energy demand from all sources and divided up the global energy market into six regions and two countries. And yet, see, guys, and you you want to pay attention to this because it's not just in America where we would be able to sell this product, but across the world. Let's continue and China. In the second column, I entered the share of the global energy market that each region or country represents. In the third column, I took a guess at what I think Tesla's maximum market share could look like in each region or country. Let's look at the assumptions that went into each. In the U.S., for the first three quarters of 2023, 13.142 gigawatt hours of grid storage was installed. Tesla deployed 11.522 gigawatt hours of grid storage in those same three quarters. Although we don't know where that storage was deployed, most of it was likely deployed in the U.S and that's where Tesla's built their first Megapack factory. That is, Tesla currently dominates the battery energy storage market in the U.S., and that looks unlikely to change. So there we go. That's an advantage right there. Just tick that on the market, right? As of right now, we lead. It's the only factory in North America, according to the manager that runs the factory in California. I covered that in one of my previous videos, and we're running it in North America. Let's continue. So my assumption is that Tesla's maximum potential market share in North America over time could be as high as 75%. As for South America and Europe, they're the regions that are the nearest to the U.S. both geographically and geopolitically. But there will likely be some competition from China and local production, so I assumed a maximum of 50% market share. China has a strong and highly competitive local manufacturing base. But Tesla has a good relationship with China, and they've already started working on their first Megapack factory there. So I assume... Yeah assumed a 25% market share. And that's a good assumption too, because China does have a good amount of manufacturing capacity. Um, we're creating a new mega factory in Shanghai. So we're going to add that online, but also not to only address the domestic market in China for that mega factory in Shanghai, but also to address the regional area also at the same time and compete. We're going to be competing with CATL. If you don't know them, you can go check those out. 
and possibly BYD. But as of right now, I don't know of a product that they offer. I only know of C-A-T-A-T-L. The Asia Pacific, in which I've included countries like Japan, Korea, Indonesia, and Australia, have a good relationship with the U.S., but they'll likely also have local battery production along with imports from China. So I'd be surprised if Tesla gets more than 25% of the market there as well. India is a big question mark because it's doing its best to build a domestic manufacturing base. So Tesla's growth in India depends on what kind of agreement Tesla and India can come to for imports and manufacturing. Yeah, you know, India is currently attempting to build out their own and they're protecting their own local market. So we're not quite sure on India. But even if they do come to an agreement, I expect competition from local companies. So again, I expect 25% maximum market share for Tesla. Lastly, Central Asia, Africa, and the Middle East are loaded with geopolitical question marks, and they might get most of their battery storage from China. Furthermore, I don't know how fast they'll make the transition to sustainable energy, which could... Yeah, you know, it might be far off for places in Central Asia, and especially Africa in the Middle East. Who knows what's going on? mean that by 2050, those countries see a smaller share of their total energy market transition to battery energy storage. So I've given Tesla at best a 10% market share in each. After multiplying each region's or country's share of the global market by Tesla's share of each of those markets, then tallying up the results, it gives Tesla a maximum potential global market share of 35% for battery energy storage. Then, if we plug the high case and the low case into the four phases from earlier, we can see that in time, Tesla could be deploying, at minimum, about 229 gigawatt hours per year of grid storage, and at most, 535 gigawatt hours per year. Before we move on to the summary, what are the major risks to Tesla's grid storage business? I All right, so let's calculate in the risk before we move forward with the projections after that, because we need to translate that into money. But let's go ahead and see the potential risk. C2. The first is delays with connecting the megapacks to the grid and transformer shortages. According to Wood McKenzie, those issues have resulted in up to 80% of the projects coming online being delayed. I'm not sure how solvable those two issues are and whether they're trending towards better or worse. It's potentially a good topic for the next video of the grid storage series. The second. Guys, transformers are very important. I could give you a good example of, let's say we're talking about affordable housing. One of the things that could stand in the way to potential affordable housing would be not only legislation, but also infrastructure, right? The electricity, the piping, the plumbing. And so with that being said, the mechanicals and sewage, et cetera. So if that's a problem, that needs to be laid out, roads, et cetera, in order to build the affordable housing. So it's kind of like the same thing. And that chain, that supply chain to deliver energy, a transformer is a part of it, right? So you're looking at generation of solar, right? You're looking at the storage. Those are the mega packs. You're looking at your home and the transformers. They're moving that energy. And that has to be brought up to date. That has to be corrected. There's a lot of things that need to be addressed there. And when they're addressing that, it's the thing that's kind of slowing up the process so we could deliver these mega packs and deliver the energy to the actual customers. Second risk is battery supply. Currently, the best cell chemistry and form factor for grid storage is prismatic LFP battery cells. And Tesla's wholly dependent on that chemistry and form factor from companies like CATL. That's a strategic CATL. Remember, I mentioned them earlier. Risk that may hold back their growth potential. How about getting your shipping rates? So it's potential, but no different than semiconductor chips being made by TSMC. Rumors that Tesla is building their own prismatic LFP battery cell production in Nevada with spare equipment from CATL. But even if that's the case, it's going to take years to hit meaningful scale. Now, this is probably more so the case because Tesla always looks to vertically integrate and take out any kinks that could be in the process. Remember, we didn't even make batteries, right? The 4680 is an actual living example. We used to go to Samsung and et cetera to get batteries. And now we create our own batteries for the most part. And so again, they're always looking to vertically integrate in everything that they do. The same is true for the 4680, which so far is only using a nickel chemistry and a form factor which may or may not be suited to grid storage and is still struggling to ramp. In summary, let's answer the question in the title of the video. How many may... Uh, once again, let me pause. It's not easy to scale, guys. Battery technology and manufacturing batteries is not an easy process. So again, we're not taking that into consideration when we think about is the competition coming? Most likely not, at least in America. Now in China, most definitely but we must compete in the marketplace that's fair. So may the competition and the best survive.
50 megapack factories will Tesla build? Based on all the assumptions I shared today, if each megapack factory continues to be 40 gigawatt hours like the template factory in Lathrop, and Tesla needs to deploy 229 to 535 gigawatt hours per year, in the next 5 to 10 years, we'll see a minimum of about 6 and a maximum of 13 megapack factories. For some perspective, Tesla is currently using about 150 gigawatt hours of cells per year for all their products. So as long as the grid storage products have a similar profit margin to what Tesla is earning on average for their products today, over the next 5 to 10 years, there's a potential for Tesla to increase their market cap by 350% from just grid storage hardware. Note that doesn't include the profit Tesla could make by using their Megapack hardware to build a business around selling power into the grid, which is an another profit center altogether. As so see, there's another profit center all in it together, which also needs its own exploration. So that's very interesting that you could bring that to the conversation, but 350% increase to the market cap just based off the energy alone. And we're talking about how many factories? That's a lot of factories, eight to 13 possibly factories. These are jobs. A lot of things are going to be created. As a final note, I've made a few bonus slides based on the four phases of energy deployment and a global regional demand to take guesses as to where and when Tesla will deploy megapack factories for the 15 or 35% market share scenarios. Bear in mind, this is highly speculative because one of the most difficult things to predict is exactly when and where Tesla will build a new factory or new product. This first slide shows all the information on one page, with the number of factories and the years. The next slide shows the 15% case on a year-by-year -year basis. The last slide shows the 35% case on a year-by-year -year basis. The first impression here is that this looks like a lot of work and a stretch, but megapacks are far easier to manufacture than a vehicle, and that's reflected in the cost of the factories. A mega Yeah, way more easy to manufacture a megapack versus a car. So... When we also think about scaling and ramping and producing these factories and creating all this different type of revenue streams, especially for Tesla, that's just a car company. We got to think about, well, is it possible for them to do this? I mean, do they have the capacity? Do they have the engineers? Do they have the expertise? And the answer is yes. Process, people, product. We have that. And necessarily, this is an easier product. <laughs> it's not as complicated as the car. Let's continue. A megapack factory costs about $400 million, whereas a gigafactory for vehicles costs 5 to $10 billion. See, so billion. So $500 million to about 5 to $10 billion for the gigafactory. Gigafactory, okay? Gigafactory is where the car is. Megafactory is where the energy storage is. 400,000 or 400 million is way better, right? And we're talking about a higher potential return for something that is a lower initial investment. Phew. That means that for even the high case of 35% of the global market share, where Tesla would need to build 13 megapack factories in the next decade, the total investment is only equal to one gigafactory. And Tesla's built three gigafactories over the past five years alone in Berlin, Shanghai, and Texas. So 13 megafactories in the next 10 years isn't a stretch. If you enjoyed this video, please... See, isn't a stretch at all, all right? They're capable of it. So anybody could make an argument. Are they capable of building that many factories? Well, then we could go back to past performance. Past performance does not dictate future gains, but it gives it a good opportunity. Shout outs to the limiting factor, fair use. Uh, like, shift, skip, uh, you know, subscribe to their channel. I think that's a very interesting channel. And as we always say, guys, there's many opportunities. And a lot of people are not just baking it into their approach with Tesla. When I have conversations about Tesla, I try to keep away from the EVs. Because, again, we could talk about that and we can have conversations, which everybody does. But everybody is not talking about all the other products that are offered at Tesla. And I think that's an advantage to actually be able to see that, be able to map it out, be able to project that into what you're buying Tesla at today. Is that added value baked in currently? And the answer is no. That's what I did with real estate, right? Where the rents are today. Okay, the price of rents today, right? The macroeconomics. And then you also look at what you could change, right? How, how can you vertically integrate? Do we get property management? How to reduce expenses? How to reduce our tax obligation? Do we go to city water, sewage, septic? What do we do? Well, 
What is the process to reducing our expenses? How do we increase a stream of revenue? Are we selling a different product? Are we, are we creating storage units also on available acres of land? Oh, wow, there's available acres of land on the back end. Okay, let's build out some self-storage units. Okay, let's diversify. So one minute, this lot, this property, is specifically only mobile homes or multifamily residential property. But now I added value and you're like, oh, well, you just do with residential. That's what you do. You're a real residential real estate investor on multifamily properties. And then you see me build a storage unit in the back of the property because it has additional acres. Now I'm doing storage also. So now I'm like industrial at this point. It's like, dang, I thought you were a car company and now you're also producing storage batteries. So this is the flexibility that Tesla has. This is called added value. So you have to see that even as a real estate investor, you have to sit back, see that value add opportunity and then place your chips and execute whatever your actual scheme is for that particular real estate investment. So the same thing I'm doing with Tesla and any other company that other people are deciding to invest in. You got to have that forewarning. So guys, it's been a great one. Again, go check out The Limiting Factor. Go check out more information and dive deep into the information. Go beyond the quarter. Go beyond the year to date. Go beyond the year. Go beyond five years and really think about the company, any company. Do the due diligence because this is where you gain the most. This is where real estate investors gain the most by seeing the value add opportunity and execute it. Everyone loves to hate Tesla, and everyone hates Tesla for some reason. But you guys got to start loving him. I'm going to let this guy take us out. Doug. You got it, good Doug. Go ahead and take us out. VPP stands for Virtual Power Plants. It means that as a collective community of power all owners, we can band together and supply electricity back to the grid just like a large power plant. Participating is simple. It's all within your app, from enrollment to participation to opting out if you must to payment you always maintain full control. You can opt out of events. You can change your backup reserve. Participating in virtual power plants really is the benefit for everybody. It's using your power wall when you don't need it to support the grid and you get paid for doing it.